All right, I'm going to get us started by introducing very quickly our panelists, um, because you really want to hear from them and not from me. Th this panel is a panel that developed because when we were working on the book, we realized that we really don't know a ton about what solo practitioners and small firms do, and yet they are by far the vast majority of people doing legal work, and in many of our law schools, that's where our students are going. They're not going to big firms. And so we think we need to know more, and we thought that these three panelists would be able to help us uh, learn a, a more about this topic. Um, Benjamin Barton comes from University of Tennessee, where I teach as well, and he is a distinguished faculty professor there. Um, he is a prolific scholar, but one of the things I have to mention, and he is also a chapter author in the book, as you heard before, um, is that his book, his most recent book, Glass Half Full, The Decline and Rebirth of the Legal Profession, is something that I think will help uh, draw, he'll draw upon the, for this conversation. The book right now is in Dean Judge Ferguson's hands. Show it. <laughs> Show it, Royal. How do you like that for testimonial? But, but only after you read this book. <laughs> if you could tell, that Royal has it dog-eared and, and tabbed, Absolutely. which is awesome. Um, Luz Herrera, who I think is the assistant dean for everything experiential at UCLA, is the assistant dean for clinical legal education, experiential learning, and public service. Um, and she is wears so many hats, but one of the things I find so fascinating about her scholarship is that it comes and draws directly from, and I don't know how she did both things at the same time, but being a community lawyer and then also starting a nonprofit of community lawyers. Um, and In deference to our nod to the former Republic of Texas, she is joining the faculty, is she not, at Texas A&M, or has joined it? <laughs> Yay! Yay. <laughs> There's something incestuous going on here. So I, we did, that was not that where she was when we, she first started working on, on the chapter of this book, which is kind of funny um, because Luce has also moved. But her work and her scholarship just have such an enormous synergy. And I think that she'll be able to really engage us in the ways that um, both law students and lawyers in their solo or small practice or small firms can be entrepreneurial and think about different ways to charge people and to um, engage people who don't usually get re legal representation because they can't afford it. And then finally, we have George Wolf, who, although he's not a chapter author, his predecessor, Alan Charn, is a chapter author. And so um, he comes in from the New York City Bar Association. He's the executive director of the Bar Association's Legal Referral Service. And he started there in 2014 after working in a similar position in Oregon. And so he's going to talk to us a little bit about how bar referral services can be a really interesting way of linking people who traditionally can't afford legal resources to lawyers who can provide affordable help. Ben? So hey, if it's okay with you, I'm going to stand. Uh, that way I can stay awake. It's been an excellent day, but it's a long day. Um, so I'm going to bring back the grumpy uncle, uh, because one of the great hopes for access to justice for the middle class is that we're going to link up a big group of underemployed and unemployed lawyers with a great unmet demand, and the problem's going to fix itself in the market. And I'm going to start by basically explaining why I think that hasn't happened and say that if we continue doing things the same way, that's not going to happen. And then end with a little uptick of ways we could actually try and make that happen. Um, and I think it actually will happen, but not necessarily for lawyers. And I'll say what I mean by that at the end. But yeah, I wrote this book, Glass Half Full. And a big chunk of the book is about this particular segment of the market, uh, the solo practitioners and the small firms, what I call Main Street lawyers. Um, and the first part of the story is to understand the growth in the profession over time. So this is a count by the ABA. Every year since 1878, the ABA has counted every licensed lawyer in America. You can see here at the far left, and I'm sorry about the small type, it starts down here below 100,000, and this is current through 2015, and we're above 1.3 million lawyers. Now I'm going to run over here. All right, uh, I break it out by bar graph so you can get a sense of the growth just since 1950. So in 1950, there's a little, a little over 200,000, and then by 2015, again, we're at 1.3 million. And notably, look at how it continues to grow, 90, 2000, 2015. 
In a second, I'll explain why I want you to care about that. But note, there's about 500,000 more lawyers added in over this 25-year period. Here it is expressed as the number of lawyers <laughs> per American. So you can see that it's grown against the population. And again, current through 2015, the profession continues to grow faster than the population of the US. All right, so <laughs> this is just a single graph that tells you how the market for legal services has done in the US. Uh, that starts in 1929 and then goes forward into 2012, and it's uh, adjusted for 2012 dollars. Okay, so the first thing that's sort of cool about this is look at how the market did from 1950 to 1990. Like, uh, there's this like sad stagflation period in the 70s, and anyone who was alive remembers that. Uh, but otherwise, the market just boomed during this period. And it's actually kind of a little bit of an economic miracle, and here's why. Over this same period of time, look at how many lawyers came online. I mean, the profession more than doubles in size, and everybody's making more money. So between 1950 and 1990, you have this crazy thing where the profession gets huger, everybody's making more money, the rising tide floats all boats. So big law, small firm, solo practitioners, government lawyers, everyone is tending to do better over that period. Now, if you go back forward, you can see after 1990, that stops being the case. It's basically flat for a while, and it goes up, and then I'll show you it's gone down since the recession. And remember, this little tiny amount of growth is shared across the 500,000 extra lawyers that join the market. And uh, because we're not doing elite law, I won't talk much about big law, but remember, <laughs> almost all of this growth over this period of time is big law. Like, big law goes completely nuts between 1980 and 2008. So that's all explained by the small portion of lawyers that are doing that. As you'll see, solo practitioners and sm small firm people fared very poorly over that time. Yeah, this is legal services employment in thousands. And again, you can see this growth is rational, right? This growth is going along with the market. Everybody's making more money. Then we had the flattening out, and now we are down again. OK. Uh, here's. GDP for the whole country, that's in blue. And here's GDP for legal services, that's in red. Again, you can see, based, and uh, I've got it through 77. Before 77, it was a different calculation, so I don't have it on the same graph. Before 77, from 60 to 77, the legal market grows faster than the US. Then here we had the legal market running, humming along with the US. And then starting in the early 90s, it diverges. And you can see now we're back down where we were in the 90s and the country as a whole has grown and the legal market has uh, stayed flat or fallen depending how you want to look at it. Here it is pulled out, just legal services. And this starts in 97 and then goes through 2013. You can see we've lost all the growth we had before the recession and again, we're now down below where we were in 1997. Okay, so this is my bar none for sure favorite graph in the whole book. Um, and I'm going to show it twice, and I'm going to explain it for a long time. Uh, but this graph explains so much of what has happened in the market for legal services. And it also explains much of the access to justice puzzle. Right, so there's two lines shown here. The bottom line, the dotted line, is solo practitioner earnings. And the solid line is law partner earnings. OK, so every year from 1967 until 2013, the IRS has gathered two different groups of tax filings. One is people who wrote that they're lawyers and filed as solo practitioners or sole proprietors in the IRS language. And the second is people who said they were lawyers and filed as partners. OK, so before I tell you what I think about this, let me give you a couple of caveats. The first caveat is, in a minute, I'm going to use the solid line as a proxy for corporate lawyers, uh, people working for businesses. Here's what's problematic about that. On the one hand, the solid line does not include professional corporations. So that means there are a number of really big law firms that are not included in the solid line. The solid line does include tiny partnerships. So the partnership of uh, Burton and Burns in Knoxville, Tennessee, to one guy, one gal, they're also included. So this line includes some people who actually work in this market, and it kind of drags this line down a little bit. 
Uh, the dotted line you may be, feel weird about in the following way. It includes people who are winding up their practice and people just starting out their practice. So if you think the dotted line is too low, that'll be fine. Good? All right. So a couple of things to note about this. The first thing to note about this is look at in 67 when we start, if you went to law school and you wanted to work for corporations and you ended up being a Main Street lawyer, it was not a complete and utter disaster. You earned about half of what you expected to earn. This chart, uh, as much as any other chart, shows the divergence of the profession into two clearly demarcated camps, the Main Street and the Wall Street uh, type, or corporate lawyers. Uh, turning to the corporate lawyers, a couple things to note. The first thing to note is look at the upward slide in earnings for these folks. Um, and if I had the, c the coinciding big law graph, it's the same exact thing. Like the growth for big law between this period of time is exponential. Uh, between the 25 years of the AmLaw 100, Big Law was one of the most profitable enterprises in the history of man, basically, like 1,000% growth for some firms, like just crazy numbers. Um, that being said, you can see it grows really, really steep, and of course, this is above 350 grand, and the Big Law one would be 1.3 million, so you can imagine what that line would look like. Uh, tough times since 2008. Uh, growth at the high end of the market is basically flat, so this shrinkage in the earnings of partnerships means that it's the Main Street lawyers who are really, really getting crushed over this period of time. Those are the partnerships that are dragging this line down. Uh, most uh, importantly for our discussion today is the bottom line. All right, so these numbers are not adjusted for inflation. So when you have a relatively flat line that starts in 67 and goes to 2013, and it's not adjusted for inflation, that means you've had a really, really bad run. And that is, in fact, the case. Hey, in 2013, the most recent year for the data, 342,000 American lawyers, so that's about a fourth of the licensed lawyers in America, earned an average of $49,000 a year. That's what solo practitioners earned. Now, I know we didn't go to law school to do math, but note, if 49,000 is the average, that means there are a lot of people who earn less than 49,000, probably half. Um, so um, if you go backwards, so you can choose this peak in the late 80s if you'd like, or you can choose the beginning of the graph in 67, but basically anywhere along here, up to here, solo practitioners have lost a third of their buying power over this time. It's just been a brutal, brutal period for them. Um, and it's continued on, like it's basically been flat from the, before the recession and going through the recession despite the effect of inflation over that period. Uh, this is just another version of the same thing, and I'll buzz through it real quickly. Oh, I'm so scrubby here. Do they show up if they're just part of a uh, multi-lawyer small firm? Just let me finish for a second. Okay. All right. Uh, on the left, this is uh, Alabama lawyers in 1985, and on the right, this is Alabama lawyers in 2009. So uh, in 1985, 17% reported earning 200 grand or more. That's down below 10% in 2009. Here's the 100,000. More than half in 1985 earned, earned over 100,000. In 2009, it's below 30%. Uh, in between 25 and 50,000, 14%. And under 50,000 is 37% of the lawyers in Alabama. So it's been a tough market there as well. OK, so um, why is that? Well, the reason why is there's just been massive, massive, massive competition in that market. And you can see it in two different ways. The first way you can see it is in the percentage of people who can't find work as a lawyer uh, getting out of, out, of, out of law school. So as this line goes up, that means the times are getting harder. This is 40%. You can see in the 80s and 90s it was better. We had the recession. It got better again, and then it got worse again. Okay. Um, maybe it fixes itself after law school. Uh, the numbers suggest not. So these four different lines, the dark blue line, that's an average, 40-year average. So this is working age people who have a Juris Doctor in the US. The red line, this is the ABA count of lawyers. The light blue line, this is the census count of lawyers. So when the Census Bureau comes to your door and they say, what do you do? You say, I'm a lawyer, and they average this out. And the green line is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's how many lawyers they think. Uh, the numbers are squishy. Uh, I think it's definitely below the census line, and it's probably above the Bureau of Labor Statistics line. But choose whatever line you want. Look at the gap between the JDs 
and the people who are working as lawyers. Uh, there's a substantial gap, and if you believe the BLS line, it's like almost half. Uh, but if you go back, it sort of makes sense. Roughly a third of the people who graduated law school since 1990 haven't been able to start out as lawyers when they graduate, and that's basically stayed true over time. So we return to this. So uh, what does this mean in terms of access to justice? Hey, if these people could meet the demand that's out there, they would. There's a whole group of lawyers who are in a desperate competition to make a living. And so if they could, by serving middle class people, they would. So then the question is, well, why? Why wouldn't they be able to do that? Part of the answer happens in this building, and part of the answer happens in the regulation. We train these lawyers only to do each case by hand individually. And then we regulate them as if that is the only way that a lawyer can behave. And we cannot do this work cheap enough to meet the demand of the middle class. So even if you're charging $100 an hour as a lawyer, which as we know from surveys is way on the low end of the market, that's gonna to be too expensive to do anything even moderately complicated. So what's the answer? The answer is that we need to help lawyers learn how to do things to scale. We need to help lawyers to learn how to work with commoditized markets, with organized markets, where they can uh, do things where the lawyers are only doing the work that must be done by a trained, super smart human. So basically, anything that can be done by a machine should be done by a machine. Anything that can be done by a non-lawyer should be done by a non-lawyer. And then the lawyers can do more work at less cost. Just one question about the data. I, I didn't see the chart here, but if you are a member of a, if you're a lawyer in a small firm, how does that, does that show up on your data? Uh, okay, so if you were a member of a lawyer who's in a small firm, right. and you're in the partner, if you're a partner in that firm, then that will show up on the upper line. It will not show up on the lower line. The lower line is only for people who file a sole uh, proprietorship. But I will tell you, based on like, like looking at the market, that uh, small firm How do you, but you don't know that from your data, or do you? No, I know that from the Apple JD data and other uh -huh. data, but no, I don't have it. The IRS doesn't collect it in that. That's aspect. what I thought. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, I want to tell you how excited I am to have this discussion having at an academic institution like NYU, and I want to thank Sam and Joy for bringing this conversation here. It's not a new conversation. Different parts of it have existed within the clinical uh, conversation for many, many years. And uh, most recently, and I think um, uh, a lot of it, a lot of what I've been involved with has really been through the American Bar Association. So I'm really excited to have um, scholars uh, together talking about these things and, and really thinking about how to move, move forward on this agenda. So, um, so I've been asked to talk about solo and small firm lawyers, and I call solo and small firm lawyers the core of the legal profession. And I call it the core because it is the most central uh, an important part of the profession, in my opinion. And um, you don't have to be believe me, but um, I, I'm going to try to convince you that that's the case. Um, so I wanted to start a little bit by just looking at where lawyers work, because this is something that I often go to uh, meetings, particularly of, of law professors, and they've never seen uh, demographics of where lawyers work. And so more and more that's been changing, but um, definitely before 2008 that seemed to be the case. So. We have lawyers uh, practice in a variety of practice settings, but most of them are practicing as private practitioners. And you'll see that where we are, most of us, are either uh, judiciary, education, or legal aid public defender. I think most of the people have, have identified themselves in those settings. And so I, th I think it's important for us to maybe take a look at, um, uh, at the 75%, because if we're looking for new solutions or uh, additional solutions to the justice gap, then I think we need to figure out where we're not yet doing enough, and I'd say that self-help and some of the automated forms that the uh, courts have been employing uh, has been, you know, kind of one of the greatest innovations in the judiciary. Uh, of course, uh, clinical education uh, in the education realm, uh, but also legal aid organizations and public defenders have kind of done as much as they can and pushed as much as they can, and I think what, what the, remainder, uh, the remaining uh, agenda there is funding, and particularly as it uh, involves uh, civil Gideon, which um, I'm not sure that's going to happen ever, but um, I, th I think it's just worth mentioning that those are the existing efforts. So 
it, when you begin to look at the at the private practice distribution of um, of the of the uh, of the bar, uh, you learn that solo practitioners are the largest percentage. And these are old numbers, but they're not necessarily new. I actually think that this number, once we get more recent numbers, uh, then the solo part of the bar is going to be larger. So. The, the last ABA numbers say that solo practitioners were 49% of the uh, private practice, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the distribution of private practice lawyers. And so, but, but that's not often the case when we're talking about access to justice, we're often focused on the small percentage, the smaller percentage of, you know, big firm pro bono, or the 1% of legal aid or public defender lawyers. And so, so I think we really need to kind of look at these basic numbers as a way to begin to inform our, um, our solutions and our conversation about uh, what we might be able to do differently or in, a, in addition to what we're doing. Um, so, and by the way, you can find these charts if you just type in ABA lawyer demographics and it'll come right up. Um, so who are these lawyers? And a few folks have mentioned that there's very little done to uh, a lot of very little research on, on who these lawyers are. And I'll talk about a couple of studies and, and say a little bit about them because those are still really probably two of the main studies, but there really aren't enough. And I will also talk um, about this a little bit just from my own perspective as a solo practitioner. I had a private practice for um, about seven years before I went into academia. And so some of the, some of the research um, is research that was really uh, you know, I've, I've gone, I've reviewed it based on my own personal interest and experience. And so, um, in 1962, there was a first lawyer uh, survey, a solo lawyer survey, and it was done in Chicago by John Carlin. It was published in 1962. What he found was that solo practitioners and small firm lawyers, but primarily solo practitioners, were first generation. They were usually from immigrant families, or a lot of them were, there was a large percentage. Uh, they went to schools that were not as prestigious. They had very little mentorship. Uh, and through that mentorship, some of that mentorship resulted in kind of higher ethical violations, uh, probably because they didn't have the systems or the support in, in place. And yes, as uh, Ben talked about, there's a lot of financial uncertainty uh, with these solo practitioners. Most of them are providing personal legal services. So if we're talking about beyond elite and a middle income agenda, we need to focus on who the biggest providers are of these services. And so, you know, there were a couple of, um, uh, a couple of other folks that tweaked, uh, tweaked with, with these lawyers and, and did some smaller surveys, and I'll talk about some of the ABA and ABF surveys, but um, in New York in 1996, there was another study. This was a larger stu study. It was probably, uh, the first study in 1962 had about 64 lawyers, and the one in 1996 was focused in New York, and it had about 102 lawyers. And Carol Saron is uh, the uh, sociologist who conducted this study. And this study focused more on how these attorneys ran their, pla their practices and, and who was in it. And by 1996, compared to 1962, it was, there were a lot more women that talked about the importance of uh, flexibility in choosing this practice, which also might give you a sense that some of these numbers that Ben shared with us, another factor could be that some people are not working full time. And so, you know, the solo practitioner designation also encompasses individuals who are not fully employed by choice. Um, uh, and sometimes by need, right? Um, uh, because a lot of these women that were in the study talked about caring not only for children, but also for, um, for elders uh, in their family. So the, the, uh, in this study, one of the things that, um, again, emerged was that these lawyers were primarily self-trained. So again, lack of mentorship. Um, and so we see a trend that didn't change for, for a number of centuries, and I think if we look at solo practitioners today, we'll find the similar, um, similar characteristics. Uh, and looking at who these lawyers are, she found three different types and character ca characterized uh, three different types of lawyers within the solo practitioners. She called one, um, you know, some of them were professional that were really focused on the technical, uh, others managerial, and those are individuals that, that really develop systems uh, to run their practices, which goes to kind of Ben's uh, discussion of systemizing and, pr and providing um, uh, larger scale representation or, or, or more volume representation. And then there were the entrepreneurial lawyers who also had systems but that also maybe focused a lot more on the marketing and, um, and being able to get the word out about what they were doing and being very creative. And again, this 1996 is around the time where you started seeing a little bit more acceptance of lawyer advertising. And so 
part of the study also reflects that lawyers were engaging in, in uh, new ways of marketing themselves. So what do these uh, practices look like today? Um, they vary, they're very diverse, and who's in them, you know, uh, on April 15th in San Francisco, I was involved with a day-long webinar uh, that was focused on incubators. And a lot of us, as we were planning for it, expected, we had over 700 people register for this webinar. And um, when we showed up, about, uh, there were about 60 people that actually showed up to the site, and the others were online. And we were surprised because we thought there were going to be a number of new lawyers and maybe individuals in law schools that were trying to set up these programs. But we actually found that there are a number of second career lawyers and retiring lawyers who are also there. And so when we're talking about um, incubators or solo practitioners, we have to remember that um, solo practitioners are really diverse because it really um, it, it catches kind of lawyers in the different trajectories of, of their professional life. Um, but these practices exist like they've traditionally done in brick and mortar offices, but a lot of them are, are done through kind of op shared office arrangements, right? And so you have a lot more, um, because of economies of scale, people are trying to save money as, as a result of, of some of these uh, economic downturns. Um, but you also have many more individuals that are involved in virtual law practice, which means that a lot of it's done over the internet and by phone. And so, um, what, what the most successful lawyers are doing is that they've really focused on particular niche markets, right? So they're focusing on, you know, something like horse law or, um, you know, um, what are some of the other populars like uh, uh, cycling law, right? So, so that they're appealing to a particular niche, a particular demographic. And so when we're thinking about the growth of lawyers, I think it's also important to remember that there's also been a growth in population. And there's also been a growth in the diversity of the population that need legal services and that are required, um, um, that feel that the, uh, that the legal profession should serve them. Uh, and so, 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 you know, we keep that in mind as we're, we're talking to not only new lawyers, but new solos about how to think about building their practices. And so um, there are two other studies that I wanted to just mention as I'm talking about uh, solo practitioners, because I think, you know, there's not a lot, but when, you know, we want to make sure you highlight what's there. There were two other studies that I think are important to look at if you're interested in, in learning more about solo and small firm lawyers, um, both done by uh, American Bar Foundation researchers in 1975 and 1995. And really what this looked like is looking at the hierarchy of the legal profession, where it said, you know, most of the lawyers that are doing personal legal services that are serving modest income Americans are at the bottom of the pyramid in terms of the hierarchy. And so what does that mean? It means that when we go to fancy law schools, we're not promoting that you should be a solo practitioner. And actually most of us that are teaching in these places are not, don't have degrees from places where we value modest income <laughs> uh, delivery of legal services. And so I think it's important to remember that part of this problem in the access to, uh, access to law, because it's not even really justice, but the access to law um, agenda is that um, is that part of it we've created by developing the kinds of models that really support the hierarchy that um, don't um, prioritize legal services to the modest income population. So we really need to begin to look at things like our own salaries and, um, um, uh, and, 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 and the kind of debt that students are taking as a result um, to really begin to see what their justice program, uh, the justice pro problem really is, is leading to. So when people ask me to explain kind of what is it that solo practitioners do, think about what your you know, brother, sister, mom needs and what their legal needs are, and that's probably what they're doing, right? Family law, housing, real estate, immigration law, employment law, um, small businesses, consumer law, criminal defense, elder law, right? So it's kind of the bread and butter of what everyday people need. And what this means is that it's individuals uh, that are being represented. It's families, it's consumers, but it's also small businesses and nonprofits and communities. That's who are represented by these solo and small firm practitioners. And a lot of these individuals are making $15, $20 an hour, right? The majority of people are not making a lot of money. And so kind of the idea of providing low bono representation comes, uh, really begins to reflect uh, this idea of niche marketing, which is saying, if you're gonna provide uh, services to a community, you need to also be able to talk in community talk. If you're talking about $500 an hour, someone who's making 15 is not even gonna give you the time of day. Why? Because there's no way they could aspire to even an hour of your time, right? And so 
I do think that part of the issue, I agree with Ben, is that we need to rethink how we are training um, our students, uh, not just for the big firm practice, but for solo practitioners, because there are a number of challenges. There's no guarantees of success. There are economic challenges that Ben has already described uh, better than I can, and there's lack of guidance uh, in terms of how we set up these practices. And then you do have these new players in technology that are saying, well, we can figure out how to do it. We have the money. We can come in with our MBAs and you know, come up with <laughs> great pockets of money to develop uh, great models. And so you know, it's hard to compete with individuals that don't have that training. So there are opportunities, though, however, in, in training law students and, and advising new solos which is really that there is a, um, some folks estimate about $45 billion uh, latent market for, uh, for, for legal services. And one of the bright spots, I think, in the um, uh, postgraduate world is the law firm incubator models that encourage individuals to be entrepreneurial. And I think what we need to focus on is figure out how to help lawyers incorporate lay advocates and technologies into their own business models. So I've ran out of time, so I'm going to stop there, but thank you very much. The magic wand, please. Um, thank you so much. So, thank you again for having me. You disappeared. You moved. Um, I'm George Wolf, as I uh, was so kindly introduced um, by Joy. The um, task that I'm going to try to do here is tell you a little bit about what legal referral services do and where they sit in this picture, because they do sit in the middle between the public and these sole and small firm practitioners. And I'm going to offer a couple of perspectives on that. I am here and have been here for about two years. Um, and before then, I was at the Oregon State Bar, which was handling the whole state. And of course, we were dealing with the rural issues that you're talking about as well. So maybe we can get into that. And I'll try to be as fast as possible, because I'm sure we can have an active discussion about that. One thing I did want to mention, because um, I also go around the country as a PAR consultant for the ABA, which is a program of assistance and review for legal referral services and help them implement best practices. So I'm very passionate about legal referral. I, you know, I proselytize about it, so you'll have to you know, bear with me there. But one thing that uh, should be clear is that is uh, almost entirely populated. Legal referral service attorneys uh, are solo and small firm practitioners. That is who they are. Um, it's an interesting data source for you as well. Um, we sometimes consider it a modern anthropological study where the rubber hits the road on, on exactly what's happening. So to kick things off, I wanted to share a prescient quote. I'll give you a second to read that. And those are the words of Harrison Tweed, who spoke to the association uh, in 1945. And he, together with Joseph Proskauer, actually founded the Legal Referral Service. So as I mentioned, it was established in 1946, um, actually filling the niche that you're talking about, the day-to-day -day bread and butter uh, for the World War II veterans. It then became such a great model that they expanded it to the general public. That's how legal referral services, uh, at least in this area, came into being. Um, I think it's really designed to pick up where uh, free legal services leave, leave off and essentially help middle America find affordable legal services. Um, there are probably stats that you could have brought in to show exactly what that affordability level would look like. That's certainly changed over time. But legal referral services have a huge public component. As you can see, 75% of the points of contact with our service do not result in a referral. We have attorney referral counselors on the phone speaking with the public, providing information for other appropriate agencies and what have you. Um, but only 25% are actually referred to those sole and small firm practitioners who participate with us. Or one of the other things they do get referred to is our Monday Night Law program, which I'll come back to. So there's a huge public service component which aligns with bar association missions and a lot of why people go to law school, you know, a lot of the core values for lawyers as well. Um, you'll see up there our City Bar Justice has a legal hotline. Um, that's a free consultation service for income quali 
qualified individuals. And you'll also see they're able to answer about one out of every two calls. Um, and they can get overrun, which makes perfect sense. Um, we often refer to each other, um, the legal referral service and the hotline. And we have no income qualification as, um, sort of levels except for our moderate means program. So that's a, a bit of the statistics. This is our library on here, and what I wanted to walk you through, we've been talking a lot about the lawyers, but I think one side of this equation I don't want to forget is the public, and what is the customer journey, and how did they find that lawyer? Um, I think it's, it, this is the modern anthropological study aspect of this that I think gets fascinating as well. So how do they come to us? What are they looking for? Where do they land? And I thought these stats would be kind of fun as well for you. That's the pages on which people actually uh, land, so what they're actually searching for. And contrast that with, that's what we actually refer. <laughs> so I think what we're in the position of doing and what is also part of this equation is how do you bridge that gap? How do you, whether technologically or otherwise, how do you educate the public? And bear in mind that if I went backwards, there's a fear factor in there. There's a lot of anxiety. And so there's a ton of um, roles and hats that legal referral services play in trying to bridge that gap and get people to a lawyer because they're petrified sometimes even just to call a legal referral service. So what is the reason for that selectivity? What that is the result of is the attorney referral counselor is on the phone triaging the call, and that's the bucket into which it falls. This is, incidentally, part of the, the stumbling blocks for technology in the past is when you just put technology to the public, a family member dies. I must need a family law lawyer. That's what the attorney referral counselors are doing. They're translating and they're connecting. So people may believe these are some of the areas in which they, you know, this is what my issue is, but this is what it turns out to really be. So big changes in the delivery of legal services model after the, the Great Recession. I, I think there's also the value add proposition of, well, what is a lawyer adding to this equation? And what is an initial consult even going to do? Because you've got people who are self-selecting to do things DIY now. And that is the impulse that brings us, bring them to our website. And we rely very much, this is now the window, not necessarily the door through which people are coming to us by updating all of this content and writing it in such a way, a sixth and seventh grade level, we're redoing all of it so that it's very accessible. Um, that becomes key to why we've had month over month increases in, in growth there. Whoops, I went too far. So what is a legal for referral service beyond the resources? Um, a generic mission statement might be that legal referral services help those who do not know a lawyer and who think they might have a legal problem find a resource that's appropriate or a lawyer who's knowledgeable, reputable, and affordable. And as I was saying before, built into that is convenience and also relief. Those are key components in the customer journey. So that's what we're building as a legal referral service, and we also maintain that relationship with the client throughout the relationship with the lawyer, because if things break down, we can step in and help correct the communication or what has gone wrong. I'll get into what qualifies the lawyer in a minute. I'm kind of moving ahead because I want us to have a discussion. So um, this is our online form. Again, part of what you're talking about in terms of the automation piece. In Oregon, we had an online uh, modest means referral application, um, also trying to use and streamline those processes and not have lawyers doing what they don't need to do as well. Um, this looks great on mobile also. Um, that fear factor really um, demands that you break this down and that it, part of this equation is to really make it simple for the public to access the legal services. So we say this is a three, three three-step process, so you just break it down, get rid of the, the fear, complete the form, or call us, okay. 
discuss the question, underscore that they're speaking with an attorney referral counselor. That's for free, so they're talking with somebody who's going to help them triage and get their head around what this issue is, as well as reassure them. It's great they're, they're dealing with an illegal issue. Um, culturally, there are a lot of things that people will uh, call completely after something blows up, and other people will, of course, be more proactive. Um, we have 10 lawyers that review the online forms, and the same 10 lawyers who also uh, speak with the individuals on the phone. So get referred or to an, a lawyer or an appropriate resource. So this is that big public service component of the 75%, three quarters of the time, they're not referring them to a lawyer. So they're helping also alleviate some pressure on the courts right at the beginning, so that's huge. Um, one of the key components, though, that I did want to also mention here is that legal referral services, and you'll see this in the book um, by my predecessor, Al, um, that 82.5% of the clients referred who actually meet with a lawyer, they pay only $2,000, I say only, but $2,000 or less, and 95.7% of the people referred pay less than $10,000. So there is a connection there as well. But a huge, overlooked, fantastic opportunity for the public is the $35 initial consultation up to, a, you know, up to 30 minutes with a lawyer, um, which is not only great for the individual and lowers those barriers to access, but it's also, again, a relief of pressure on, on other parts of, for example, the judiciary and otherwise. Uh, is it a condition? Oh, they absolutely have to adhere to that, if that's what you mean. It's in our rules, yes. Monday Night Law, I mentioned. Um, this is another fantastic program. I inherited this, and I can't take credit for it, but it's a great concept, and I think it should be duplicated around the country. Um, brief overview. These two are half-hour slots. They're for free. People call, schedule, come in. They meet with two volunteer lawyers. Those volunteer lawyers obviously have to be admitted. They need two years of practice. We have about 100 to 150 lawyers that volunteer for this. They're trained in two three-hour sessions in September, and then they commit to one Monday a month for 11 months. So then that participation can count as pro bono hours. And the lawyers, as you can imagine, would like that because they're not committing to an ongoing representation scenario. And the public is, is really having a fantastic benefit because with a consumer law issue or something, they can't afford to have two lawyers look over a draft letter that they're doing. So it's really a win-win from that standpoint. And they, too, end up acting as a portal. Um, there's no income qualification. It's free for the public. And it also ends up being the triage for our moderate means program. Um, that's where those volunteer lawyers will help people actually access those services and go through there. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention about modest means um, from the national standpoint in Oregon, we had something, and I wanted to speak to this, maybe we can come up to it uh, again. But in Oregon, we had a program, it was more expansive than this, and I hope to bring this there. It was all areas of family law. Uh, it was landlord, tenant, uh, foreclosures, criminal law. And it was a scaled or tiered hourly rate based on the federal poverty guidelines. So it was 60, 80, or $100 per hour, depending upon where the individual qualified. And we were getting up to the 4,000 applications per year range. And this is huge within a very big state of being able to help people out in rural communities where you have lawyers who, yes, they're underemployed and they're looking to have more work and they will take a case at $80 an hour. And you, so you have to bear in mind in more rural areas that it, that helps them keep the lights on. I've been on panels like this with those lawyers and also in front of law students that say, you know what, a modest means program, when I got out of law school, uh, about 90% of my caseload were moderate means cases and I'm here to tell you, you can make a living on it. And that's almost a direct quote. So it's important to bear in mind how that links up. Um, San Diego, interestingly, is doing something um, where the moderate means program ends up being a place that lawyers, for example, who are just starting out, almost like an incubator a little bit, have to do a couple of years before of family law within moderate means before they are ever even allowed to apply for the legal referral service. So it's an interesting um, idea that they've put into place. Um, really briefly, I don't, what do I have, 30 seconds? <laughs> One minute. Qualifying the lawyers. 
Um, and why do they join us? I could get into this a little bit um, more. We are more arduous than the rest of the country. Um, we have hoops and light them on fire. They do have to submit <laughs> writing samples. They have an application. They have an interview with one of our lawyers who's been practicing for years, a committee member, and one of us, either the deputy director or me. Um, but I think the other public piece of this, too, is that um, there are lawyers, not only, obviously, I've gone over the consultation piece, but there are lawyers who are very well trained, experienced, and will take a second look at cases. And we just recently had an exciting case that resulted in a $6.2 million verdict. It was a pregnancy discrimination case. It was two of our panel members. Several lawyers had passed over this case, and they saw a pattern, and it became a multi-plaintiff case. And it's the same uh, two gentlemen who actually did the World Yacht case. I don't know if people are familiar with that Court of Appeals opinion having to do with sort of wage, hour, and tips. So I could go on for hours. You, you're very tired. I'm not. Um, <laughs> 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 so I just thought probably I should turn it back over to you so we can have more of this discussion. Um, there is a whole feedback mechanism. We actually do send a paper survey to everybody who's ever received a referral. Um, interestingly enough, in this electronic day and age, that tends to have a much higher response rate. So people can just delete um, an email. Um, but that's how we do follow up on the lawyers, um, not only for discrepancies, because we rely on, on their um, um, payments to us to keep all of this other work going. Do folks know how we're funded? Can I just do that mm -hmm. for two seconds? Do folks know, have you ever heard of percentage fees? Raise your hand if you've heard of percentage fees. Two people, no. Oh, three, four. <laughs> so ethically okay, so we won't go down that road. Um, but why I think this is a fantastic resource for sole and small firm practitioners is because sole and small firm practitioners, on top of trying to make a living, how do they market themselves? What are those traditional ways in which they market themselves? And this is why I think legal referral services fill that niche, is that the percentage fees, which is the major source of our funding, is what the lawyers pay a percentage of is what they actually earn and collect from the referrals. And I say it slowly, earn and collect from the referrals, because when you think about any advertising, marketing, anything you typically do, you pay that in advance. You don't know what the return on investment is going to be. In legal referral services, you have earned the money, collected it, so it's obviously successful marketing, and then you're paying the percentage on that. I, as a former panel member before I ever became, uh, you know, heading up any legal referral service, I thought, oh, that's really smart. You know, that's not like pay-per-click or doing any kind of thousands of dollars at something and let's see if it works. And I think that is the core of how sole and small firm practitioners are able to work with the legal referral service. And by the way, they're a very devoted community. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was great. So we can open it up to questions. And as people come up to the mics, I want to just start by saying that we've had this conversation grouping solos and small firms together. And it really struck me in listening to um, everyone talk that maybe that grouping might not be as useful in, in, in certain contexts in terms of training or economies of scale or thinking about how low you could charge someone a rate depending on how much your overhead is and how much you're sharing that. And so I'm curious if, if before we have a question from the floor, if you guys would react to why we shouldn't be grouping them together and why, how that concept might not be helpful. I, I mean, you can. It just I think once you get beyond two lawyers, it makes it more difficult, right? Because we do, I mean, the majority are solos, the 49%, but once you start getting into the two to five, you go up to about 64% of all lawyers. But um, once you get beyond that, you know, you could have more boutique firms that are dealing with a specialized group of um, corporate clients, boutique firms. Um, but, but I do think that most solo lawyers, even though they're solo, they're still sharing space. And so... You know, I'm not sure that it's like a bad idea or a good idea. I think we just need to understand more to be able to even make a determination if it's good or bad. You go ahead. We'll go in order. Oh, uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, basically you just have to see it on a spectrum, right? And not all solo practitioners, I mean, some, the, the, I, the, at least a plurality and probably a majority of solo practitioners do a diversity of areas. So that actually makes their job even harder. Um, and they're working by themselves, so that makes their job even harder. So even when you go from one to two, that's a substantial economy of scale. 
And if it's two people who only do criminal defense, well, now you're really starting to get someplace. Whereas if you have five people all together in a firm doing general practice, it's almost like they're all solo practitioners that can share a secretary. All right. That's what I was going to say. And it also is hard to break down because the rural-urban divide as well plays into that in a big way. They joke in Eastern Oregon, and it's like, well, what do you practice? I practice door law because, you know, it's anything that walks through the door. So, um, it, and yet they can be pretty good in many areas of law. So, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure that it's an important distinction, but, yeah. Um, I'm from Washington, D.C. We don't have a modest means uh, a robust modest means program. We just, in the last couple of years, tried to get something going. And this was just sort of a group of attorneys from sort of different uh, walks of attorney life getting together and seeing what might come up with. And the obvious problems we came up with, well, you start from the position that there are all these excess lawyers, you're all this need, boom, you put them together. A lot of them are young lawyers. And a lot of them, you know, uh, are, would be happy to do the modest means kind of work. but couple problems, the mentoring. I myself, start, you know, in, for a good chunk of my professional career was a solo practitioner and I was scared to death virtually, you know, three quarters of my life, for make, you know, <laughs> making a mistake. And, and, and my um, position in, in all this was uh, we can't advocate for any kind of system, we can't help establish any kind of system that doesn't have really good built-in mentoring to it. So. You know, and even even when you have incubators that teach law students and maybe, you know, hang out with them for a year or something, I don't know that that's really going to do it enough. So we were thinking about some kind of um, committed, sort of like a pro bono equivalent, an online service for small and sole practitioners where you could have some vetted, experienced attorneys who would be willing to answer questions a lot of them electronically, some of them, you know, on call, and seeing if something like that could be put into effect to solve the mentoring problem. The other thing was um, student debt. And if folks don't want to go and become a nonprofit together, they are not going to be qualified to have loan forgiveness, even though they'd be doing the same work as a group of people that got together and created a nonprofit. And I don't know if, if you can comment on the prospect of uh, law schools sort of having a new look at who they forgive loans for. I think there's a group that's advocating for um, uh, basically lower kind of individuals that are in private practice in these community-based practices to qualify for loan forgiveness in ways that nonprofits do. Depending on the state that you're in, you might not be able to set up a kind of lower fee uh, project through a nonprofit organization. So that depends on UPL rules, as somebody mentioned, uh, but it also, you know, uh, has to do with what the, uh, what, the, what the state bar accepts in terms of what types of entities they certify um, to, to practice in that state, so. Um, to speak to your first question about the modest means or moderate means programs, they go by both names. Um, that is exactly in Oregon what was done uh, very successfully. It happened to be one of those more office suite areas where there were a number of less experienced practitioners um, and there was one sort of guru of family law. And they would have their own, it was actually their own listserv. It was specific to family law. They were moderate means uh, attorneys and they would try to solve the issue among themselves. So like 15, 20 lawyers. And when they finally came up with their best group answer, so because that's the big issue when you when you actually survey mentors, is is I'll get into that in a sec. But basically, that was what they would do. They would tee up the question so that it did not waste the mentor's time, and it was very surgical in its approach. Um, and that was something else that I think, with the um, mandatory mentoring that's happening around the country in a couple of different state bars, Oregon being one. Utah is another, Georgia has implemented that as well. They start to have statistics on how do you actually put together the mentor, and I'm not going to say mentee, I'm going to say protege, because uh, I don't like mentee. <laughs> and that actually, is, there are statistics coming out where you can actually see the best practices in, in actually cultivating that relationship. Yeah. Hi, my name's John Lobear. Uh, I'm sort of semi-retired, and I'm just doing uh, 
practicing law for fun, doing kind of low bono and pro bono work, and I have a new appreciation for how difficult it must be to be a solo practitioner because even the smallest case that I handle, I mean, partly I'm doing a lot of different things and I'm learning all this for the first time, but even the smallest case, all kinds of unexpected problems come up and issues that, so, I mean, I think it was Grant Gilmore who said that in hell there will be nothing but law and due process will be meticulously observed. <laughs> and, you know, I think part of, the, part of the problem is that our legal system is so, I mean, in part, it's kind of a, a perverse consequence of all these due process protections that exist, but we have a Cadillac legal system and it's so complex in many areas that these issues do crop up all the time. And um, so I think perhaps, you know, some attention should be given. And maybe it's too big a problem for any of us here to even think about. I don't know. But to, to simplifying our legal system, which would benefit not only people of moderate means, but actually perhaps everybody in the end. Yeah, I'll go ahead and say that, and I meant to squeeze that in. Yeah, law reform is clearly part of the problem. It's not just the way lawyers train people and the way uh, bar associations regulate them. It's also that the procedure is too complicated and that the law underlying law itself is too complicated. I will note that in some ways you can argue that's the best advertisement for hiring a lawyer. And so there is an incentive to have the law be as messed up as possible. And the sure. cost of legal education is too high, which we'll talk about tomorrow. But Ben, doesn't that also speak to it? You're talking about streamlining the processes. Right. Because, I mean, uh, there are different jurisdictions where California, for example, have adopted forms and approved forms through their JCC forms, which is a great step right. in that direction. They did that years and years ago. In Oregon, it's still the Wild West. We, we had a panel on that. Sir. Sir. Hi. Um, I'm Rob Sote, and I... Um, do research at Court Square Law Project. Um, what I'm wondering is, um, what do we know about the um, sort of life careers or life courses of uh, solo practitioners? Do they stay in solo practices? Uh, that $50,000 a year salary, is that um, something that uh, you can expect to see the rest of your career? Yeah, so um, the Cadillac, the best data on this is the, after the JD survey. It's a longitudinal study of people after they graduated. And yeah, solo practitioner, but there, uh, more people are moving in and out of solo practice than other areas of the law. Um, and that shows basically around the same amount of earnings and the decline of earnings. Um, and it, it, it just sort of actually makes sense, right? If you're earning $35,000 in a year in a job that's super hard, you'd really rather be an insurance adjuster or manage a Denny's or do something that's not what you're currently doing. So yeah, there's definitely movement out of that. And there's also movement with people displaced out of big law or out of other places trying out solo practice mm -hmm. to see if it'll stick. Just a quick, my name is Edward Reisner, just a quick question for Professor Barton. Uh, you, that IRS graph that you uh, referred to a number of times, you said it excluded PCs. Uh, yes. And so my question is, do you have a sense of the breakdown uh, of the percentage, relative percentages of PCs among who would have been in the partner group and who would have been in the solo group? And is there any significant disparity uh, that might have affected the analysis? Yes. The PC number is way smaller um, than either the partner number or the solo practitioner number. The partner and the solo practitioner number together adds up to about half of the, the licensed, maybe it's 40%, but it's a big chunk of the licensed lawyers in America. And then the rest are doing the other stuff that, that Lucia. We have run out of time, but we are going to have a, a half an hour session after Milan and we have no break built in right now. So can we hold your question and just move, I'd like to make sure we keep running on time and give Milan um, a, his half an hour that was allotted. Um, and so as he pulls together his stuff and as I let this panel go, thank you so much, that was great. <laughs>